right. On the line, we have Mike Hogue, uh, permaculturist extraordinaire. How are you doing, Mike? Oh, oh, wonderful, Dan. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, you as well. Uh, can you give us an a introduction of who you are, what you do, and your contact information? Sure, yeah. Well, you can find out more about me uh, by visiting transformativeadventures.org. Uh, you can also check me out on social media for Transformative Adventures. And we have a wonderful Facebook group that I spend a lot of time in, which is Permaculture in Action, uh, Transformative Adventures. And so that group is something that I'd invite anyone who wants to find out about permaculture to, to, uh, to be involved in, too. And, uh, you know, I got into this whole thing because I kind of grew up doing a, a sort of a, a traditional kind of, um, you know, what, what we would have called at that time, homesteading uh, lifestyle. And I'm using that term because I, I hope today we're going to be talking about decolonizing permaculture and decolonizing this whole sort of movement. And, of course, that's a, a term that I avoid now because of its genocidal history. You know, these days, I prefer the term small holding. Uh, but I grew up doing that yeah, kind of... I, I, yeah, please. I think that small holding has some, uh, also some uh, negative repercussions uh, in the slave movement. Oh, does it? Okay, well, I, I was unaware of that. So was some... I'm not sure about that. I, I just saw somebody post that, and so uh, I haven't investigated myself. Hmm. So go ahead and continue, sorry. And, and you know what? But this is exactly a great sort of discussion to be having because we can always be continuing to educate ourselves on these issues. And all of these little opportunities that we have, these vestiges of our language and ways of thinking, uh, are all opportunities for us to grow towards the kind of future that I think we all really want, one where everyone feels valued and one where, frankly, we actually have a future. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, just, Absolutely. yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it was something where, uh, having grown up do that, doing that and worked on farms of all different scales, it was something that I never thought I would do again, because, you know, when I look back at my childhood, half of it was carrying firewood and the other half was spent like weeding. <laughs> it was just so much work. And yeah, I still always had that love of nature and, uh, and, uh, it wasn't until I really discovered permaculture that uh, there was this promise that I could potentially have more of those things. The connection with nature, the connection with, with, uh, with good food and with community, uh, without all of the hard work and everything that I had been raised with. And um, with that, it seemed like there was this potential to transform a lot of the systems that I knew were driving climate change and mass extinctions and uh, uh, building, you know, ocean dead zones and enslaving people around the world. And um, it just really, you know, it, it was just really intuitive for me that this is where I wanted to be spending my time. And this is, this is I really think, the way that we get to that future. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and it's discussions like this and then identifying uh, the colonizing forces and the effect that they have on us that uh, we need to uh, shake and uh, reshape into something beneficial. Absolutely. You know, when we, even when we talk about that whole idea of that work situation that I, I, I mentioned growing up in, and the whole idea of uh, uh, that, 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 you know, raising your own food and having this kind of a lifestyle is, is, uh, has just got to be tons of work and now, I felt like we were always pushed to hustle, hustle, hustle when I was a kid. And that itself is kind of a vestige of colonialism. Uh, because, uh, you know, if, you, if everybody just owns their own land and, uh, and is, has the freedom to work the amount that they work, want to work, and really it doesn't even feel like work anymore. At that point, it just feels like you, you know, you, it's the things we now do for recreation right? <laughs> Playing in the garden and going fishing together and stuff like this. We do those things now for recreation. And, uh, and you know, instead we have this whole idea of, of, of work. But if you have your own land and your own community together, then we can meet our community needs in a way that 
that requires so much less. There are civilizations around the world for millennia who were able to meet all their needs on maybe a dozen hours per work a week. And so it doesn't take as much time as I, w I was told when we were growing up. But, you know, if you have a bunch of free or exploited or slave labor, well, then you can just you create systems where you just work people to death. And that's what we've inherited. And here we are thinking that we're free and we're still working ourselves to death. Yeah, uh, I have had a philosophy growing up that uh, women's medicine was about interactivity and men's medicine was about controlling the ball, which means controlling your outside surroundings to uh, make happen what you want to happen. And so seeing that, uh, the, the difference between those two genders is that we are definitely in a patriarchal society because it's all about controlling and man manipulating the quote unquote natural resources, which we call elder relatives. So that's uh, one thing that's how you can tell that we are in a patriarchal society is because of the extraction of mother. And of course, they didn't start extracting mother until they started calling mother the earth. And uh, so English is a very objectifying language. I, I don't use the mother. Uh, and I just use mother. You know, it's more of an embodiment than a, um, uh, an objectifying thing to talk about, you know, from here to there. Yeah, a absolutely. And uh, as you were just and pointing one out, thing I, I'd like to I'd like to address uh, on your uh, uh, what you discussed there is a uh, uh, land ownership, you know, uh, and of course, you know, that is uh, genocidal in just in its own terms, you know, because it used to be native land. And once you remove the native from the land, that's genocide. And so uh, and then land ownership uh, uh, itself is a uh, uh, very me, me, me driven. So you can tell the maturity of a nation by its society. Are we me, me, me? Uh, because that is a child's way of growing up. It's a survival instinct like a child. A child has to be me, me, me. But as you grow into maturity, you move into us, us, us. You move into a giveaway mentality. And so that's how we can tell uh, a nation, a person, a party, if it's me, me, me versus us, us, us. You know, the me, me, me is rights, rights, rights. Us, us, us is responsibility, responsibility, responsibility. So if we had land in commons, uh, we all had to take care of that land. Uh, just uh, uh, like I suggest uh, that if people want to know how related we are, build a longhouse, put multiple families in that longhouse with multiple generations, and then you will find out how intrinsically related that we are and that whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Mm, yes. A lot, you know, it's, it's very, and a very old element of, of uh, colonization is divide and conquer. It breaks these... Absolutely. It breaks our relationships to each other and to our village and to the land as well. It breaks those connections so that it can mine them for profit. Well, let's uh, uh, delve into that a little bit. Uh, so uh, uh, that uh, uh, is uh, that there's many different forces that work in, in concert, uh, uh, government, religions, fashion, uh, sports, uh, military, uh, music, even, you know, all these things work in concert to colonize us. Uh, for example, uh, uh, religion takes away our critical thought because once you believe something, you no longer have to think about it. Uh, sports uh, put you in a nation state mentality ready to hate the other the others uh, at a at a, a drop of a um, something fast that drops <laughs> it, and uh, you know uh, not, of course, not only that. makes you feel insecure yeah you know, and, and it's all wrapped up in the language and not only do sports do that they put us in the instant mindset of competition that the way to, uh, to, to rise up, the way to meet our needs, the way to gain respect in a society is competition instead of cooperation. Yeah, that is uh, uh, what, what's called a, uh, what is it, an accomplished-based uh, uh, mentality uh, uh, where you have to prove your worth by doing the work. When we are born inherently beautiful and inherently valuable, uh, uh, people who were born with original sin really have to uh, uh, work their way out to being inherently beautiful. Yeah, that's a, a, a fascinating story of, um, 
you know, uh, Abraham Maslow, who thought he was going to, he had a hypothesis uh, that all people inherently were very competitive and that all people inherently would try to oppress and dominate each other, to rise up in a social hierarchy. And uh, so uh, at that point in time, uh, you know, the, the Blackfoot Nation was still a group of people who were considered just becoming accessible, and he wanted to visit them specifically to prove his hypothesis. He went uh, uh, to, the, to this nation to find evidence that it was inherent human nature that we would oppress and dominate each other. And instead, he found a people where, as you just said, he said that was the, the, the big thing about it, was that everyone was born with inherent worth and treated with that. And maybe you made a mistake, but that did not diminish your inherent worth. That was your mistake to be corrected, not something that was inherently a flaw about you. And uh, so everyone had that inherent worth, unlike in the, the European society that he had witnessed, where, where, as you said, we were born without worth and had to prove it by dominating others and ascending the, the social hierarchy. And extracting the land, uh, which, which domination requires. Uh, yeah. In this financially driven, debt-based society. Those those two things kind of go together, don't they? You uh, you know the the wealth, as you said, are, are our resources or our elder relatives primarily, and our and the, these things that belong really inherently to all of us, and it's only through this domination and hierarchy that we can take more than what's really our fair share. Yes, exactly. And uh, that uh, is because of the mindset of lack versus the mindset of abundance. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the mindset of lack is, is, the re is the reason why we have billionaires and is why uh, uh, we go to Mars instead of plant trees. Yeah, and it's, it's a whole, there's been a whole industry developed to making you and me and everyone else feel like we are exactly what we were just saying, like we don't have inherent worth unless we buy this and buy that. And so we get on that consumer treadmill because we want to feel like we're worth something, don't we? So we've got to buy all those knickknacks just to, just to prove that we're, we're good and worthy human beings. You got to have the right you know, pair of shoes and... <laughs> So that's uh, the result of civilization, which is the uh, uh, actually colonization. People just put a pretty word on it. Um, is that uh, uh, you have to uh, fill this nature-shaped hole in you that colonization creates because we've been separated. Uh, I see the first separation uh, comes. So we have a, a symbol. It's a, a, a cross with a, in, within a circle. And that is the like the four directions, the equinoxes, solstices, uh, four animals, four plants, uh, the stages of growing from birth to death, uh, all kinds of things uh, are, are in the circle. And then, uh, uh, but when you remove that circle and leave just the cross, an instrument of suffering uh, uh, of a dead god, uh, that's when people get really, really insecure <clears throat> because they can't actually pray to the creator. They have to pray through a third-person proxy, uh, Jesus Christ, they can't heal their evils because a third-person proxy uh, owns their evils for them, so they can't own it, so they can't heal it. And when they they can't even say their prayers to the Creator because some dude spreads his arm and says your prayer for you, not even to the Creator, but to his proxy. I mean, it's an incredible element of control, isn't it? To take... Yeah. To it's, take it's like sacredness, a syndrome. yeah, to take sacredness itself away from people and place it up there in the sky somewhere, and you can only get a taste of it if you join the club and you you do what we tell you to. And they had to place it in the sky because they were denuding the earth, so their gods couldn't they could not live amongst their god. Right, uh, you you mentioned us being a. Uh, 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 a mainstream uh, 
you know, mainstream society, mainstream American society being a patriarchal culture. And all patriarchal cultures tend to, to do that. They have masculine sky gods, whereas um, matriarchal societies tend to worship feminine right here, right amongst us. Something that gives birth to all of us and that we all live among and that continues to nurture us for our whole lives. That's a direct relationship with the sacred. Every time you eat, you're interacting with something that's just immeasurably sacred. And I would have to say that, uh, you know, books control the, uh, societies, you know, the Bible, Torah, Quran, you know, uh, but what is governs life is truly the sacred, truly sacred uh, uh, from root to tip, you know, from... Uh, uh, from mycorrhiza to uh, the birds flying, you know, all these uh, elder relatives bring us life, you know, and of course now we're suffering through, you know, the lack, you know, 35% of insects and birds gone, 65% uh, of animals gone, 90% uh, of the oceans fished out, all those elder relatives that created all this, what they call wilderness, and actually it should be referred to as community, um, because wilderness leaves you bewildered, uh, and, and that we have to reintroduce uh, uh, our way of living and contributing to life because that's what, uh, we, that's what these animals do. If you want to know your purpose to life, uh, look at these animals. Uh, what are they doing? They're contributing to life, and we're animals too, so let's contribute to life. I got a phone ringing, but I can't answer it because I'm doing a middle, inter middle of an interview. <laughs> Call after the show. Yeah, you know, it's... Um... It, 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 it's so arrogant of us to think that, uh, <laughs> that we can move into an area. Now look at uh, the European colonizers came to North America. Uh, uh, an abundant, robust, beautiful, amazing, rich culture and society and said, oh, well, there's nobody here. <laughs> you know, there's, there, there are no yeah. white people here, I guess. And so it's, and yeah, so we're going to, we're going to settle it. But even if it were, even if, if it were not for the humans here, I mean, the civilization, the culture that was here is so much more than even just the humans were here. As you were just saying, it's, it's a sophisticated interaction with all of the other beings in the system. And the, uh, I, I love, and I think this is something that I hope all of us here on Turtle Island these days can, it can integrate into our way of thinking is that our elder relatives are part of the community too. It's not us and nature. It's one community that we're a part of. I'd like to uh, just express uh, uh, some of the terminology that we're using here because uh, when I say elder relatives, and Michael, Mike says elder relatives, we're meaning the, the plants and the, the stones and the stars and the animals and the, uh, the unseen ones and the ones that fly and the ones that swim and uh, all of these things that are our elder relatives, just for our listeners. Yes, thank you. Thank you for making that clear. Yeah, um, it, it's, it, 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 and it really is so much bigger than ourselves. And you know, when we talk about this, and we're, we also talk about this word permaculture in our discussions, and of course, we could see that as a, you know, we say formally, it's a system for designing human habitats and our lives so that they, they just make nicer places to live by reintegrating all those communities, all those elements that we talk about. We could say, it, in a very real way, permaculture was originally envisioned and created to be a sort of tool of of, of anti-colonialism. At its best, I really believe that that's what it is and that's what it was created to be. And it's really about, we, we talked earlier about how the method of colonialism and the method of corporations, which are a tool of colonialism, they were invented to be a tool of colonialism, which we can talk about, uh, the, the, the method that they use is to break our connections to break our relationships with each other and with the planet so that they can mine those that, that broken energy there for profit and 
what we're talking about doing with permaculture is really creating a nicer place to live by restoring all of those connections. Yes, and, then, and to do that, they fill us with fears, doubts, insecurities, shame, blame, and guilt, which we weren't born with, but society gives us and puts on us. And also the nuclear family, you know, is terribly detrimental. Uh, these nuclear families are uh, insecure just uh, by being one single family in one single house. Like, for example, you know, uh, if I am without my community, I'm walking around with, you know, no thumb on one hand and no hand on one arm, you know, half a brain and, and, and one leg because my community completes me. It makes me whole. It helps me to uh, achieve my uh, um, potential. So that's what community does. It, it unites us and makes us strong. It's, it's divide and conquer because if I can, you know, you and your neighbor and your, the people who live around you and your village, you could, you don't need corporations, right? You don't need this big global corporate system. You, if you worked together, you could meet your own needs in a much more abundant sort of way. Uh, so if we can divide you up and put you in separate little boxes that you go into and uh, make you jealous of each other and what you each have so that you try to uh, you know hide in your little boxes from each other and compete with each other and you know, wear different sports team uniforms and all that uh, and root for different teams, if we can do that, then instead of you meeting your, your each other's needs, well, then we can sell you all these products. Oh, yeah, you need TV dinner, TV dinner now. You know, <laughs> you need all of this. You need transportation to get your job so you can buy your TV dinner. You, you, everything now, everything that we use to meet our needs, you know, we get from those systems. Yeah, and instead of being fulfilled by uh, <clears throat> living a full life, contributing to life, we have that nature ship hold that we fill with distractions. And we have to distract ourselves from the suffering that we don't we're suffering from. <laughs> yeah, and, and the more we're suffering, the, the system's quite happy to have us suffer because the more we're suffering, the more stuff we buy so that we can ignore the fact that we're suffering, suffering instead of really reconnecting to the things that would, would actually make us feel fulfilled. And this reminds me that... Uh, in permaculture, we have this uh, you know, uh, uh, one book that eventually be, uh, became sort of a curriculum for learning permaculture. We call it the Permaculture Designer's Manual. And in the first, uh, the introduction to the Permaculture Designer's Manual, on, uh, on, uh, which actually begins with, um, with an acknowledgement of Aboriginal and Indigenous wisdom, and the key paragraph that really defines the whole book and defines permaculture, says that the, the goal or what we need to do is to all be able to readopt sophisticated indigenous and aboriginal worldviews in which we value all life. And once Absolutely. you have that, uh, once you have that, once you, once you fill yourself up with all life, you have... You have endless, you have infinite wealth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, we really have to re-indigenize. Uh, the, it's very hard for uh, black people to re-indigenize because they don't know which tribe they came from, which nation that they came from. But for all the so-called uh, quote-unquote white people, uh, in which there is no white people, there is no white stand, there's no white topia, there's no white land. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, everyone should uh, call themselves by the nations that they come from because those are powerful, powerful nations in Europe that uh, have a way of contributing to life. And, and when if you call yourself white, you adopt into this uh, racist genocidal power structure that is these United States. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the one thing that I could, could say and applaud um, our, uh, you know, uh, uh, people of color communities, our black people of color communities in America is that they have done, uh, and I think they're doing a tremendous job. You know what they do have? They have 
uh, a shared, a history of shared struggle here today in, in North America. I think they're basing a, a true re-indigenization on this, this fact that they, you know, under, under colonizer culture, they were the people who, uh, who interacted with the land, you know, as uh, they were the people who grew the food. They were the people who built those relationships. A lot of our, our you know, inherited agricultural knowledge um, here, you know, frankly, it either came, it either came from, from native communities who taught the first Europeans everything that they knew. Otherwise, they would have, you know, they weren't farmers. They were urbanites who came over here from cities hoping for land. They had no idea what they were doing, and they would have died if it weren't for, uh, for the, the basic gardening knowledge and wisdom that they learned from Native Americans. And, uh, and then, you know, the other part of it largely came from, uh, from black farmers doing that work. And some of our great agricultural scientists were black farmers, too. Um, so this is, you know, I think they have that. I think that, I think there is a struggle. And it's a, a difficult thing for, uh, for, um, for the people we call uh, white people, because we've had that culture and that society taken away from us. And um, you know, a lot of us do find some, some, uh, some wisdom and friendship and guidance from our local uh, native communities and, um, and from exploring our own backgrounds. I, I, I love that you bring that up. I, I think that, the, I, I think that the, the way forward there is that we, uh, you know, we all here now on Turtle Island share this, uh, this what's really sacred, this, this beautiful place where we're where we're trying to, to build a new future together. And again, for our listeners, when we say Turtle Island, we mean this uh, North American continent. So uh, uh, also uh, what's uh, rarely mentioned is uh, that natives were slaves longer than uh, African uh, people were and uh, died at a much higher rate as well. But nobody ever talks about that because the black slave trade was so sensational. Mm. Yeah, 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 uh, and uh, and crimes against um, against uh, native people here by the federal government you know, continued uh, right up you know through my lifetime. You know, after I was born, we were still perpetrating uh, you know, forced sterilizations without consent on native women and. Um, and uh, allowing people in, in native communities um, to 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 live in uh, really a, a sort of forced poverty, you know, we we almost have this idea. Well, we we talked before about the abundance that was here in North America, you know, the place where I'm called talking to you from, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, was once known as, uh, as uh, Kikianga, which was the, the blackberry bush or blackberries. And because this whole area was extremely lush, uh, productive food forest and just filled with blackberries, filled with other things too. And, uh, and it was a population center because of all this rich abundance. And so we almost have this sort of myth, you know, that, uh, that Native Americans just sort of like lived off the off the off the wild you know that they just sort of uh were like were like animals you know and just sort of lived in the in the woods they created this abundance we took that away we took away these abundant places and pushed native americans off into very marginalized places so we almost we the myth that I was taught growing up was that, you know, well, this is just the way Native Americans have lived. You know, we haven't taken anything away from them. This is just how, this poverty was the way they lived. That is so untrue. They live, your Native Americans here on Turtle Island lived in an abundant, beautiful food forest. We took that away and pushed them to the marginalized places where they lived in poverty until, until extremely recently, even today. And the brutes, the Brutes didn't know the sophistication that they were walking into uh, by looking at uh, companion planting and food forests and polycultures, and, and uh, uh, even the clan system was far uh, above their ken, uh, a far more sophisticated way of uh, uh, living in society than they ever knew. 
Uh, oh, and then uh, also what you said earlier, you know, the, the uh, uh, crimes uh, generated against uh, natives are still continuing, and that goes for police too, because we're the highest uh, uh, number uh, of Native Americans are the highest killed by police, except through the ages 20 through 24. So they kill us at a much higher rate per capita, per capita than they do black people. Yeah, yeah. And then there's government genocide policies as well, still continuing, you know. I mean, you still have, you know, unknown forced sterilizations. Uh, uh, I was alive when uh, the boarding schools were still going on. My father's a product of boarding schools, his father. And then uh, the, the blood quantum that, that happens, you know. Uh, uh, so my daughter is not even Native American. My daughter... I mean, if you looked at me, I looked native as hell, you know. But my daughter, she is not enough of one tribe because I'm three quarter of three different tribes. She's not enough of one tribe to register in any of the tribes. So she's been genocided out of being a Native American. So the mm -hmm. blood quantum is is another uh, genocidal policy that continues <clears throat> to exist today. And as far as I know, we're the only pedigreed nation on earth. Yeah, we. I mean, we could add to that uh, uranium mining and, and the nuclear industry and environmental racism as well. Where uh, are are these are these a form of forced sterilization as well? We know that they have an impact on that. It's um. It's. I mean, we have we have a long way to go to decolonize America. Yeah, and for that, we need to grow up and be mature. We need to adopt that uh, us, us, us mentality and uh, be a cohesive community and uh, contribute to life. Because all we need to do, we don't need jobs because all work creates pollution. Uh, we need to grow our gardens, take care of our children, our families, uh, be community, contribute to life. That's all that we need to do. You know, and even permaculture is not enough. You know, we have to do permaculture for permaculture's sake. Uh, in our language, we called old man Aki Wainsey, earth caretaker. That meant he went out there and managed the forests, managed the zone five, which turned zone five into a zone four because there was no four, zone five in indigenous way of thought. Yeah, and, uh, and we, should, uh, we should mention that is um, uh, Dan's talking about a, a permaculture tool for thinking about how we make a good balance between our uh, between humans and elder relatives in a landscape, and uh, so we would divide any piece of property that we're uh, that we're building a relationship with that we're going into community with. Uh, we would think of it in terms of like a zone one, which would be in zone zero, which might be the actual place that we're living, and then zone one might be a place that we cultivate more intensively. We might have some of our main gardens there. Uh, and this is a way that, that smart human communities around the globe have, have interacted with the land since, since for as long as we're, we know of. You know, this is something that was only really broken down uh, by colonialism and really only really fully broken down since the Green Revolution and, uh, uh, you know, and the policies uh, uh, maybe starting really in like the 1930s or so. And, uh, and uh, so then as we move out from there, we get more and more, uh, the land becomes more and more the domain of the elder relatives. And so when we talk about zone five, we're talking about a place where we are fully in the domain of the elder relatives. And we only go there to visit and to learn and perhaps sometimes uh, uh, to, to help out. For example, if humans have caused damage to that system, we might intervene to fix damage caused by humans. But otherwise, you know, we, we, uh, we try to leave some places where it's really truly the domain of the elder relatives. And so zone four is right on that cusp. It's the place where we really come into contact, uh, where we still are managing it more for to meet human needs, or I don't like the term management. We are co-evolving with it in a way that meets more human needs. We call these agroforest systems, forests that also meet human needs. Um, so, so yeah, I, I love, you know, this zone system is one of my favorite permaculture tools because it, it helps us really um, 
meet our needs in a way that can really stop feeling like any kind of work and really have much greater balance with our elder relatives. And it, it, it ensures that in every community, every village, every piece of land, there's still space that's zone five for our elder relatives. So I, I'd like to tell a story about a short woman who was asked by a, a non-Indigenous, uh, a Native woman. She was they asked her, uh, uh, imagine yourself alone in the woods. And she, she couldn't do it because she's amongst her community. She's amongst those who give her life, you know. And again, Aki Wainsey, old man equals earth caretaker. So we have to decolonize 0.1 is the way I like to see it, the, the, the space between our ears. That's where the main decolonization needs to happen. And again, Zone 5 culturally would not exist in my, in my culture because we farmed that. We uh, planted for elder relatives. Uh, uh, we planted berries where they grew best. Uh, so Zone 5 was our Zone 4. Hmm. Yeah, that's... Uh... I, think, uh, zone five, I think Zone 5 is necessary in today's society because the huge amount of population that's out there that we need to keep people out of zone five in order for zone five to be uh, a fully breeding there's yeah there's there's something of of uh you know there, it may have been grounded in the old environmental myth of pristine nature which again separated humans from our elder relatives. We're no longer a part of, of nature. They're over there in zone five. That's nature. You know, this zone four is us. I think uh, for me, the, the, the uh, maybe, and you can let me know what you think, a healthy view of this is that, um, is that, uh, is that not every space has to be intensively managed for human needs. There can be places, and again, we may manage them, and yes, we may, we may still go there and forage some mushrooms. We may, uh, you know, we may gather firewood if we, at times, there are ways we can interact even with that zone five that meet our needs, and we can manage it uh, in, in a way, or caretake for it. We can be caretakers of it, uh, but it's there in, in a way, a space set aside just so that we know we're setting something aside for other species because here we are in this, uh, this uh, fastest mass extinction event that's ever happened on this planet. And it's because we're pushing every ecosystem to produce for humans at unsustainable rates and there's not enough left over for people. So in, in this case, I, I think I agree with you, in our sick society, we it's good to have this idea of just some space that's left over for biodiversity, for elder relatives. I agree with that, but ultimately I agree that uh, Zone 5 is a divide and conquer. Mm. Uh, uh, unintentional, but uh, still there. You know? So, uh, Also, let's, let's talk about the ethics. You know, I mean, the ethics, uh, earth care, people care, fair share. Now, earth care and people care, who separated those? You know, why is there two ethics for what should be one ethic? Uh, it should be community care. And that relates us with all our elder relatives as well, you know, and not just the earth. Uh, uh, but it really uh, involves you into uh, being intrinsically related with uh, uh, all that uh, earth care and people care, you know, those two things, which should be one thing. So community care should be, there should be only two ethics. The second ethic, or the third ethic is... Uh, 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 fair share, which is used to be, you know, Bill Mo according to Bill Mollison, you know, uh, uh, set limits to population, set limits to damage you do, return of the surplus, uh, and so on. Uh, and that should be uh, responsibility. You know, fair share makes it like, oh, whoop de doo and, and pos toxic positivity and all that stuff, you know. But responsibility really tells where it was. And in order to be responsible, we need to have a cohesive society where we all interrelate with each other and we all look at something and say, let's clean up this pond. Let's pick up this river, you know, type of thing. So let's clean these waters, you know. So that's what we need to do as communities is uh, have a, a commons you know, versus private property, you know. So if we had a commons, we would all be invested as a group into maintaining the commons. So, and, and that's what we are responsible for is to that which gives us life. 
Yeah, I, I, I like that quite, quite a lot. You know, uh, Bill Molson, with the whole idea of the three ethics, in, in the designer's manual, he introduces that simply by saying that in, in mainstream Western society, in a colonial society, the first thing that we think of, no matter what we're doing, the very first thing we think of is profitability. You know, is the money, is the finance of it. How are we going to pay for this? How is this going to make money? Usually what we're really asking is how does it make money for rich people? How, does it, how, do we, how can we make more money for rich people with whatever we're going to do? If we want to improve education, the very first thing, thing we think of is how can whatever we do with education make rich people richer? If we want to improve nature, the first thing we think of is, you know, an environmental issue, the first thing we think of is, you know, like the climate change. You look at all the solutions to climate change and we're always talking about, well, how do we solve climate change in a way that's positive for the economy? And what we're really saying is, I, I, so that it makes rich people richer. <laughs> that's our first thought. Bill Mollison, when he came up uh, with uh, and, and proposed these three ethics, um, he cited them, he sourced them, or cited them from uh, discussions that he, he said he had with uh, uh, the Aboriginal population in, uh, in Australia that he was learning from. And, um, and, but the main point there was that he said, our first consideration, well, no matter what we're doing, shouldn't be making rich people richer. It should be ethics. It should be, does it care? And I, I agree with you. I, I, I think, again, this, this separates us from our elder relatives. And, and yet I can see a point when we're talking to people who are mainstream Americans, telling them specifically, does it care for people? Does it care for, uh, for the earth? And is it, is it actually fair to people? I, I, I agree. It, it could use some critique and improvement and a lot of my PDCs over the last 10 years, my classes, I should say, over the last 10 years, I've, my students have taught me the same thing. And we often come up with an idea or some alternate ideas. For example, just, uh, you know, whatever you're doing, try to do it in a way that cares for everything. <laughs> yeah. I think a uh, 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 new ethics uh, uh, should be uh, uh, under a uh, uh, subheading beneath uh, 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 community care and responsibility. The two, my two new earth true ethics, should be reindigenization, decolonization, actually decolonization, reindigenization, and then naturalization. So I'm working with a, a group uh, out of North Carolina and here and there uh, that uh, we have a Turtle Island traditional ecological knowledge permaculture convergence. And the whole idea behind that is to relate the permaculture people with the tribes and teach them various uh, water harvesting techniques, uh, growing food growing techniques, uh, 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 principles, uh, all these things, and then have the tribe teach the permaculture people the stories, you know, of how they did things, you know, how they grew food, you know, the, the animal patterns, uh, the uh, um, you know, stories about how the bear got a short tail, how the loon got so flat, you know, how maple tree uh, uh, syrup went to maple sap, you know, stories like this that helped us to interrelate and have a relationship with our elder relatives out there that give us life. So that it's the exchange that, that we're after. Because I don't care how they do permaculture in Africa or Indonesia, but I do care how they do it here in Turtle Island because there are specific ways that these tribes in these bioregions took care of the earth that, that made it uh, uh, regenerative. So we have to adopt these ways. So that's the, that's the way the whole all the whole permaculture movement should be doing is contacting tribes and seeing how they did things, learning their stories, and becoming relatives with them. I I think that's a absolutely beautiful uh, uh, work that you're working on. I I can't applaud it enough, and I I look forward to learning from it and growing with that myself. Uh, yeah, we we started. Um, Earlier, I said that uh, the, the, you know, the key paragraph that defines permaculture in the Permaculture Designer's Manual states that the, the goal is for us all to uh, adopt sophisticated indigenous and aboriginal worldviews where we all value all life. And so this is exactly what you're talking about. And I, 
Uh, I, uh, Bill Molson used to talk about the, the method of doing permaculture in, uh, with, um, with indigenous communities. And usually what, you know, this is, you know, this is a really interesting topic to me because um, Bill Molson was very passionate about indigenous wisdom and about permaculture as uh, anti-colonialism and empowering indigenous people. And uh, he said, you know, when, when you go into a community that has intact life ways, we is, and this is really, he was working with people, you know, people who might be called white in this, in this case, people who wanted to go and do work. And, and he, uh, what he usually said was that um, was that it was actually colonizer culture that had destroyed the permaculture, and so when he would go into places, he wouldn't say, "This is how you do things. This is this is how you do permaculture." He wouldn't teach indigenous people how to do permaculture. Bill Molson would go to to places, and he would ask. And this is the question he said all permaculturists always need to be asking. He said he would ask. How were things done here before colonizers came and missionaries came and messed everything up? <laughs> and a lot of times, because we've been imposing white supremacy on people globally, people would say, well, you know, we were doing things all backwards, and they'd feel embarrassed about the backwards way they used to do things. And Bill Molson would teach people, no. The way you were doing things was truly regenerative and sustainable. And it, it kind of was a case of using white privilege to, to, to allow, to defeat this internalized white supremacy or uh, internalized racial inferiority that white supremacy had imposed on people. I, I just, and, and, you know, he always would point out too, then if, those indigenous people just re-embrace their own indigenous life ways. They didn't have to do permaculture, call it permaculture. They were doing something better than permaculture. So I think you're doing the most important permaculture work that I can imagine being done today. That was my very next comment, is that uh, permaculture is not enough. Uh, and I've been kind of alluding to that uh, uh, here and there is that, uh, uh, again, talking about the Zone 5, you know, and uh, Aki Wainsey, uh, Earth Caretaker. Uh, uh, permaculture is human-centric, and we don't put the animals and the trees before us. We always put our needs first, and that's uh, 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 what I would call um, um, almost a type 1 error, you know, almost catastrophic, you know, because... It uh, uh, puts us first, which we've been doing the whole time. You know, we don't put, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the salmon first. You know, that uh, feed the uh, the orca. You know, in order to do that, keep the rivers clean. You know, uh, we don't do that. Uh, and permaculture is human centric because it's about getting what we're squeezing what we need out of nature, while having our our systems contribute to nature. And so, uh, and I think uh, Bill Mollison himself said, uh, we need to do permaculture for permaculture's own sake, rather than for, for our own benefit. Uh, I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more um, uh, than, uh, well, I, I guess what I, I would say is that I'm, I'm agreeing very much and also slightly disagreeing in that, you know, the, I think what you just talked about was the initial view, vision of permaculture. And it's very much what Bill Molson himself said, uh, that, uh, that in fact, there are several quotes where he does say, yes, the whole point of this is that we have to start putting nature and, and, and ecosystems and the balance of our elder relatives first, and we need to start, adopt that indigenous worldview in which we begin to see ourselves as part of the natural community again instead of something separate uh, from it and um, so I think maybe and uh, this whole thing about decolonization I think that was the original view of it and I think some of that has been lost by parts and some people who are doing permaculture and we definitely, you know, the, the work of permaculture is to you know, raise up indigenous voices and also indigenous movements and, uh, and to follow those. And, um, 
and to adopt indigenous and Aboriginal worldviews, as, as Bill Molson said. So I think, I think what you're doing, I would say, is a reform movement. It's bringing back that, that what, what permaculture was really always meant to be. Yeah, um, and I feel that permaculture is a gateway to spirituality because uh, uh, many tribes, myself, uh, uh, feel that all these elder relatives are is spirituality embodied, spirituality made physical. And you can't help but be uh, healed when you plant seeds and when you take care of trees uh, and you contribute to our elder relatives somehow. Uh, and so, uh, and that is the ultimate meaning of life, really, is to contribute to life. You know, one of our uh, highest ways that we can be as a human being is a helper, Oshka Bewis, and, and that is uh, the, the pretty much the highest form that you could be, you know, of a human being as a helper. You know, you could, you could say the chief is, well, no, actually the chief is, uh, is at the bottom of the hierarchical period, pyramid. So uh, he's a servant to all, and so it's the people who are on top of that pyramid, you know. That's uh, and then uh, on top of that are elder relatives. You know, we're suffering through ten thousand extinctions a year, last I heard, and uh, we need to really step up and, and take care of our systems. Uh, and permaculture is the best way that uh, a science-minded people like those who are living here in, in the Turtle Island, actually, I'll call it United States in that sense. Uh, because they need something simple to follow. They need a formula. They need to, they need to be told what to do. You know, they don't, there's not a lot of uh, because of the insecurities and fears and the sense of lack. There's not a lot of uh, people uh, uh, with that sense of bravery uh, to do what needs to be done. And so people need. That's why people love Trump. They want to be told what to do. I think it's a, a genetic carryover from being uh, serfs and peons uh, over in Europe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, and this is this is again something that I think Bill Mollison himself said. Uh, who is, by the way, we talk we keep talking about this guy, uh, Bill Mollison. He wrote the Permaculture Designer's Manual, and uh, as I said, he began that book, and he began. I'm told every class that he taught with indigenous wisdom and with crediting uh, in indigenous wisdom as, as, as one of his major inspirations. And, um, uh, and with that, he always, he basically said that, uh, that indigenous people, and this is kind of a, uh, one way that permaculture needs to be decolonized is that we do have permaculture people who are going out there into indigenous communities and saying, you guys are doing everything wrong. Here's here's what you need to do. And Bill Mollison always taught that indigenous people don't, with intact life ways, don't need permaculture. They're already already doing the thing. You know, at most maybe they could use some of the tools for like community organizing and energy self sufficiency, some things like that maybe. But for the most part, they have intact life ways. If they need permaculture at all, it might just be for people with white privilege to show up and say no. This is this is okay. This is sustainable. This is the way things need to be done because a lot of governments are will oppose indigenous life ways, right? So sometimes it takes Absolutely. that white privilege to protect it. But otherwise, permaculture is to re-indigenize mainstream white society. <laughs> well, you know, absolutely. Uh, re decolonize, re-indigenize, naturalize, and benefit. You know, benefit. So, you know. So uh, uh, because we used to be beneficial entities here uh, on uh, Turtle Island, and uh, as what they would call a keystone species, hierarchical sense. So we've run out of show, Mike, and I really appreciate you coming and talking, this lively discussion, and I hope our listeners uh, learned a, a thing or two. And so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dan. Again, always a pleasure. Yeah, we'll have you back on soon again because you're one of my favorite interviewees. Oh, great. Look forward to it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Bye, everybody. Bye.